Well, thank you, and, and, and um, congratulations to the authors for a very timely and useful report. I, I would say that Cyrus has actually mentioned several of my points, so thanks to Cyrus, for, yeah. uh, <laughs> for which does bring me off to talk a little bit about my area. Um, when the Tax Justice Network was created, which is just over 10 years ago, um, we were the first civil society organisation mm -hmm. to really start engaging at the international finance level with, uh, on, on international tax governance. Um, and we had a really big problem on our hands because we couldn't identify which institution was the appropriate institution to deal with. Should we be dealing with the OECD, which I have regularly described as the pretender to a throne that has no right to claim the throne of international tax governance, but nonetheless it's taken upon itself to, to, to f create the framework of rules. Should we be dealing with what was then the, the ad hoc group committee of experts on international tax matters? Um, or should we be dealing with the IMF or others? Um, and into this melange of institutions we plunged, we were the first organisation, a genuine civil society organisation to attend the UN Tax Committee in its several decades of existence. Um, we did find another NGO called the International Chamber of Commerce sitting there, <laughs> headed, would you believe, by the tax director of UBS Bank. <laughs> um, in we plunged with no clear idea of why it was that developing countries felt so excluded from this UN process. And the exclusion happened at many different levels. The, the agenda setting was quite exclusive. The, just the sheer cost of attending their meetings in Geneva was quite exclusive. The, the language used by the technocrats was quite exclusive of people. And I think these problems remain unresolved. Tax is a horrible area to work in because it's so exclusive. I think this report is right to give one for inclusiveness, a score of one out of four, and right the way through, or one overall, because this is an area where we have chaos. There is no clear political mandate for the United Nations C Tax Committee. The OECD continues to claim pretensions to govern in this area, but without mandate, and its global forum process has been um, even around automatic information exchange processes, remains really exclusive. They, they've set the agenda and they've involved developing countries only insofar as they consulted developing countries on their capacity to implement the rules which they're coming up with. They're not actually talking about the rules themselves. So I think that the report is absolutely right in the way it looks at um, the way um, the international tax agenda is being shaped quite clearly on the financial stability side. I, I think the situation has not improved whatsoever in the last five years. If anything, I think it's deteriorating. Now, the debt level, it is deteriorating. Social inequality and political instability, I think your assessment is broadly right here as well. Um, quality of life and government legitimacy. The legitimacy remains challenged. The OECD's legitimacy in this area remains challenged. So I think that this this report has pretty much <coughs> pinned down the problems we have. Is there a sign that the chaos is improving? Well, yes, I think that we are seeing help helpful signs. I think, first of all, there is a very much greater openness to inclusion of civil society. The OECD, for example, is going overboard now to include civil society in, in its discussions. The United Nations Tax Committee, however, remains massively under-resourced. Um, and the ability of poorer countries to genuinely engage with the United Nations Tax Committee, attend meetings, attend meetings, not only the plenary meetings, but also the subcommittee meetings, is, is, it remains weak. Um, all of these things need, to be, need to, be, to be resolved and resolved fast, but this requires resource. And that's an issue that isn't discussed in this report, but without the resourcing, it's, it, we're simply not going to see improvement. Um, I suppose, finally, on the, how do we measure the impacts? The, the big question here is, are we, can, can we see any improvement in the way that we are moving towards being able to tax capital and tax multinational companies more effectively, either here in Europe 
or in developing countries? I think the answer to this stage is no, we're not seeing much progress. Will BEPS address this adequately for, for developing countries? I very much doubt that it, it will within a reasonable time frame. But what I have biggest, the biggest problem for around the BEPS process and around where G20 is taking us is that they are still not prepared to open the agenda up to consider whether we need to move beyond the current system of taxing multinational corporations and open up to unitary taxation. When we discussed that with them, it was closed down immediately. So the uh, control over the agenda remains in the hands of uh, uh, the wrong country. How are you doing for time? Do, do, do one, one minute, Max. Um, and that, that, I suppose, raises the big question of how can we engage developing countries at the level of setting the agenda, either for the agenda for the OECD or the agenda for the UN Tax Committee or for other organisations. Um, so that, that's a starting point in empowering them and also empowering civil society from developing countries to work alongside or in some cases in opposition to their country's positions in order to push the agenda forward. John, thank, thank you so much for that. Again, we'll have an opportunity to come back to some of these issues. Dirk. 